Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Reexamining Antitrust uh, in the Digital Age. As Dustin said, I'm Ben Brody, a senior reporter at Protocol, specializing in tech policy, and uh, I'll be your moderator. Uh, we have a really exciting panel today on what I think is the hottest issue in tech policy. Going back to the 1980s, antitrust was a relatively sleepy area of law. Yet as the power of tech giants in particular has grown more obvious, competition policy has become increasingly high profile. Would-be reformers are everywhere, on both sides of the aisle. And they suggest everything from uh, increasing uh, enforcement to going back to mid-century jurisprudence uh, to incorporating workers' privacy and the politics of Silicon Valley. Uh, the government work product, if you can call it that, has been remarkable. Google is facing three or four lawsuits by states and the federal government, depending on how you count. The FTC's Facebook lawsuit was dismissed in June, but the agency is likely to soon refile. And Amazon and Apple are under investigation. The House Judiciary Committee recently advanced a major overhaul, and those are just focused on four companies. In the broader economy, the White House also issued its sweeping order on competition just last week, and senators are working on all sector proposals. Some view these developments as a renewing of a charter of economic liberties on par with the Boston Tea Party. Others see it as a hatchet being taken to the American free enterprise system at the behest of failing competitors. We're gonna to get to all of those issues and explore how this fight reverberates in law, policy, politics, and business. But I wanna get us started with a discussion with two experts who can help us define some of the nuances and tensions on this issue. Elise Dorsey is a professor at the Scalia Law School at George Mason University, who formerly served in the Justice Department's Antitrust Division and the FTC. And Rachel Bovard is the Senior Director of Policy at the Conservative Partnership Institute, having spent years as a top staffer in the Senate and the House. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Uh, so I'd love uh, for you two to start out by telling us a little bit how you think we got to this moment and where you hope uh, it'll go from here. So Rachel, why don't you kick us off with that? Well, thanks, uh, Ben, and, and everyone for having me. Um, it's, it's a great question because I think had you posed it five years ago on the right in particular, everyone would have just said, what? <laughs> what is antitrust? What are we doing here? And I think, you know, largely the right has woken up to the threat of corporate power acting at scale because they've seen it in their perspective wielded against them. And primarily this is through, I think, the big tech platforms. That's the perspective many people have. But I think, you know, that has triggered a lot of curiosity around how concentrated power operates in our market beyond tech. You know, you're seeing Republican senators now talk about concentrated markets in pharma, in ag, in all these places that I think, you know, before many of these Republican senators would never have met a merger they didn't like. And so I do think that there has been a little bit of a sea change. And, you know, I think primarily it's also a philosophical change for the right, because a lot of times, you know, for the last 30 years, I think the heuristic has been, you know, this very sort of libertarian emphasis on there is no bigger threat to liberty than the government. And I think that that outlook has changed slightly to say that, you know, concentrated corporate power acting at scale can also be a threat to liberty, particularly when it works hand in glove with the government in an ideological fashion. So that is, I think, the, the a motivating factor for many on the right who are now interested in antitrust enforcement, um, you know, whether or not it needs to be updated or does it simply need to be more robustly enforced? I think that is the sort of internecine debate on the right at the moment. Yeah, Lise, take it away. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's certainly a very interesting time uh, to be an antitrust. Absolutely. When I first started, you know, working in this area several years ago now, right, when I told people I did antitrust, it was a lot of just, you know, glazed looks and very little interest. And that has um, changed pretty dramatically, with, even just within, you know, the last handful of years. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of this, we tend to see these kind of sea changes in antitrust, um, you know, throughout the last over a century now, right, since at least the Sherman Act was enacted, um, we'll see these kind of waves of populism in the country. And, you know, each time we see that, um, we've also kind of seen a corresponding discussion within the antitrust world as to, okay, what is it we really should be doing, um, you know, with these, with businesses, how is it that we can make our free market work for us the way that we want it to? 
Um, and I think, you know, it's a combination of that plus, you know, these tech companies have really, you know, changed the market and the economy um, over the last several years. You know, the, the so much of, you know, our economy now is focused on these, these tech areas and, you know, it's been expanding and we haven't kind of seen um, a populist wave yet that also has included, you know, all of the tech companies because, you know, these are, you know, some recent revelations. So I think it's kind of um, a bit of a perfect storm of a lot of, you know, um, angst that you tend to see come up again and again throughout history. And, you know, all of these, you know, new tech companies that are doing a lot of different things and a lot of things, you know, the public didn't necessarily know they were doing, doesn't necessarily understand very well. Um, and, you know, a lot of, yeah, kind of feeling like the government maybe isn't necessarily um, handling it the way it should be. So I think it's a really interesting time to kind of try and figure out, okay, what is it what is it that we're doing here and how do we continue to make sure that we get the innovation um, that we that we need from the economy that, you know, has been a reason that the U.S. economy has been so successful in the last several years? How do we preserve that? And I think that's, you know, kind of come to the forefront of the discussion um, in a public way outside of just the antitrust bar. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think you you make actually exactly the point that I was going to kind of follow up on, which is, the, you know, the Sherman Act was passed mostly to tackle railroad trusts. Uh, you know, it never envisioned or potentially never envisioned platform economics, multi-sided markets, zero price offerings, consumer dark nudges, dark patterns. Uh, so maybe at least you could you could start out by telling us, you know, do you think that the current law is up to the challenge of the digital digital economy? And, and is that maybe a difference uh, between Rachel and you? Um, yeah, you know, I have to, you know, I can respond, I guess, and then Rachel can tell you uh, if she disagrees with anything or what, what, if she agrees with anything, maybe. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's really important. So, you know, kind of, again, going back to the Sherman Act and the very beginning, right, it's, it's not necessarily a statute that in the same way we think of modern ones, right, where it's very detailed and, you know, explicit and, you know, a, a clear intent in what Congress intended to do, right? There's, there was a ton of legislative history and there's, you know, a discussion around, you know, what in the legislative history matters. Um, but the statute itself is pretty bare bones. And so intentionally left a lot to the courts, really, to help be, you know, deciding the contours of the law to, you know, effectuate and make this, um, you know, very broad statute workable. Um, and I think, you know, the, the court struggled with that, with that for a while, like having that broad mandate. Um, and, you know, like there was, you know, twists and turns, there was a lot of, um, struggle within the courts early on to, you know, be consistent and figure out, you know, how can we develop a standard that is coherent, um, and has predictable outcomes, outcomes that are predictable and not just that, you know, in Justice Stewart's terms that the government always wins in these cases, right? How do we, you know, effectuate the rule of law here? Um, so there was a lot of that when the, the cases were in the courts. I think one of the things that's, um, you know, kind of gotten us to the present situation is, you know, over the last several years, um, the FTC and the DOJ, and I think this is in line with, you know, broader trends outside of the antitrust world, right? But but those agencies have put a lot of enforcement, used, um, you know, consent decrees and other, you know, internal kind of killing deals or, you know, getting consents, getting terms before these, you know, kinds of cases ever got to the courts. So I think that's part of the problem we're seeing now is the courts haven't had much of an opportunity um, to address these kinds of cases. So, you know, folks are kind of equating um, what may be problems, um, you know, with how much the FTC or DOJ are enforcing with what they can actually accomplish in courts. And, you know, some of this is, you know, these are some some really tricky issues. So when they do get to the courts, it, I think, you know, will take some time for them to sort it out. And there's, you know, I think a, a rush right now to kind of, you know, have everything sorted and have it figured out. And um, I think a question of, you know, whether we're going to continue to let the courts play this really important role that they have traditionally served within antitrust and, you know, as fact finders and using their comparative advantages in these spaces, if we're going to allow that to continue or, you know, if regulators are going to step in and try and bypass some of the courts. So I, I do agree that I think the current standard can apply to a lot of our current problems, although I will say I'm willing to be convinced otherwise, <laughs> right? Because I think this is the crux of the debate right now for many is does the current standard actually apply? And I would say, you know, I agree with kind of how Elise laid it out in the sense that, you know, in, the statutes themselves are so vague that, you know, prior to sort of Bork and the Chicago School, I think you saw enforcement swing sort of wildly, right? There was no real ballast. And I think the consumer welfare standard 
arose to fill that void. And I do think antitrust enforcement needs some sort of anchor. Um, and economic analysis and the consumer welfare standard provides that. But I think the more, you know, and I will say I'm not a practitioner in this space. So when I sort of wandered into it, I was actually very taken aback by a little bit of the totem worship I see around this idea of the consumer welfare standard that it cannot be challenged. And at the end of the day, it's a policy, right? And over time, we revisit policies and we say, are current harm still cognizable under the standards that we've been enforcing? And I think in many cases, what I think is a very good development in antitrust, which again is that anchor of the consumer welfare standard, has been almost very narrowed to this sort of fixation on price when you now have markets that are zero price markets. You know, So how do we take, I think the question is, how do we take that sort of coherence that I think Elise rightly pointed out and translate it to these modern markets you know, that we have. And I think I, I tend to agree that the current standard can do this and you do need a framework like it provides, but do we need a situation where we now start bringing cases where you know, in, in zero price markets, we're now saying, okay, there's no price, but is there something else of value? What is the value in the transaction? Is it data? Is it privacy? Is it things like that, that I do think that you know, the consumer welfare standard can um, act upon, but it's going to take a little bit more of some novel legal theories or, or, or testing out, you know, and making more robust effort at enforcement than I think we've currently seen. Because to Elise's point, I think a lot of the frustration that I hear from members of Congress is that, well, we haven't enforced, right? We, we look back at the, at you know, the, what is it, 750 mergers and acquisitions over the last 20 years in the digital space, none of which really received any critical review. Is that something that should continue? Can we continue it under the current standard or do we need to update it in certain areas? Um, and that's, I think, where you're seeing, you know, some agreement across the right for everybody from Josh Hawley to Amy Klobuchar to Mike Lee now saying, well, the current status quo isn't working. What do we need to do to update it? And of course, they have markedly different proposals to do that. But I do think you're now seeing consensus around this idea that, you know, we don't necessarily, we may not need to upend the framework, but we do need to tweak it to make sure it's applying in its full remit and its full capacity. Yeah, Elise, I wonder if you could uh, weigh in as our sort of top uh, legal practitioner, maybe about uh, the state of the consumer welfare standard, either sort of as practiced or as enunciated, or just if there are other uh, changes you would make, uh, resources, merger filing fees, uh, clearance processes. There are a lot of things sort of in the bureaucracy that we might not think of, uh, but that you think can maybe bring out uh, more fair competition and, and uh, more robust enforcement if that's what's needed. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, you're hitting on really all of these like very important questions that, you know, the courts, the legislators, the agencies are are struggling with right now. I will say, um, I feel like there's a bit of a persistent misconception about the consumer welfare standard and what it does and its alleged fixation on price. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've spent, you know, the last few years at the agencies and, you know, a few years before that in private practice. And, you know, the, the whole time, right, the price is a very important thing. And I don't want to undersell the importance of it because, you know, it's, it's where we have a lot of, you can often get a lot of probative value out of price evidence, right? So it often tells us a lot about what we think a merger, you know, is going to happen. And, you know, if we're also talking about, you know, redistributive effects within the economy, you think about, you know, the price effects, let's say in like a grocery store merger or a hospital merger. Well, if those are going to make prices go up, the people who are most hurt by that are, you know, the folks with the least household income with the least wealth, least amount of wealth, you know, who can't afford really any kind of increase in prices. So, you know, it's, it's very important and like there is, you know, certainly you see this up reflected a lot in the case law. Um, there's a lot of discussion about prices. Um, but when the agencies are looking at these cases, it is far from the only thing they're considering. So, you know, I worked in the front office of the, the DOJ and the FTC over the last few years. I saw a lot of cases come through. Um, and just in my experience, there wasn't a single one where the staff came to us and, you know, were presenting the case and their analysis and they had only looked at prices. Um, they're always looking at, you know, kind of what else is going on. How do we think these companies are actually competing in the market today? What does that look like? Like what's driving the competition? Is it, you know, on quality terms or is it on innovation and introducing, you know, new updates or what be it? Um, and so I will say kind of to that point, I also took a look at, um, you know, public merger complaints. The DOJ had filed over about a 20 month period. 
um, you know, just to, to, you know, have some publicly available data on this. And there, there wasn't a single one of them that relied solely on alleged price effects. Every single one of them included other alleged harms like decreases in quality or reduced innovation or R and D lower services that, you know, consumer choice was going to go down. So I think, you know, there's, there's a bit of a struggle in, something's getting lost in translation when this is, you know, coming to, uh, you know, legislators and folks outside of the antitrust world um, is, you know, the consumer welfare standard really does do a lot more. And I think, again, to kind of get back to a point, you know, we've been discussing a little bit so far, right, the courts don't necessarily see all of those cases. So in, you know, the cases that I mentioned, the merger complaints that were filed, um, I forget the total, but there were only a handful, only a couple, I think, actually, that actually got to the court. Most of those, again, were filed simultaneously with a consent decree. Um, so you don't see court cases where the courts themselves are grappling with what is the consumer welfare standard mean? And, you know, in this case where innovation is, you know, we think innovation is the crux of the problem. How do I address that as a court? And, you know, what are the limitations and how do I decide whether there's a violation? And so I think part of that is, you know, the, the real struggle here is it's not necessarily obvious um, exactly what the consumer welfare standard is capable of because, you know, some of these things, you know, they're either ending before they get to the courts um, or, you know, the agencies are letting them through and there's not, you know, in the public arena, this like really, um, you know, robust discussion that you see in the courts where you can figure out some of the contours. So I think that's part of what's been been lacking and leading to a lot of the, the discussion we're currently having. Yeah, Rachel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot a little bit here. W what are some of those changes that you might want to see, whether it's in the consumer welfare standard, the bureaucratic setup uh, of the two agencies, the, the legal focus and standards um, that enforcers are dealing with? So I think, you know, when we talk about kind of this price fixation, I think perhaps it does get conflated, I think, which is with an overall concern about sort of the primacy of, of economics, right? When we're looking at how these antitrust cases are are assessed and then brought. And I think there was a lot of frustration maybe to highlight this in sort of when all of the <laughs> documents were leaked from the FTC, when we actually saw how the sausage was made on, you know, why FTC decided not to bring a complaint against Google in 2013. And that I think highlighted for a lot of people, you know, look, the remit of the antitrust law is law enforcement, right? If anti-competitive intent and harm is taking place, those laws are supposed to address that. And yet what I think a lot of people took away from that was you have this primacy of speculative economics, basically, you know, speculative cases, claims being made that ended up being wrong about, you know, the mobile market, about, you know, how search, how, how uh, data ad, ad tracking was gonna work, all these things that didn't actually pan out, but that was what sold the FTC commissioners over and above actual evidence of anti-competitive intent. I mean, you had actual emails from Google executives saying, you know, quote, we are going to own the market, you know, things like that. And so it's interesting to see legislators respond to that because I think that's when, you know, we talk about this fixation on price. I think, you know, Lisa's right, you know, there's, it's, you know, we need to be specific about it. And I think it does get conflated sometimes with this idea of an overemphasis on economics, which was never the intent. You know, if you go back and read Judge Bork, it was, he, he even warned about this sort of economic extravaganza where we over rely on, on this speculation, which is what it is. It's completely speculative about what will happen in the market. And Mike Lee, actually, when he introduced his antitrust bill, I think one of the, <laughs> maybe undersold parts of it is, I think it's section 509, which basically says, look, if you have actual evidence here in, it, it doesn't use the term email, but you know, he was talking about anti-competitive intent, that is presumed, the court will deem it anti-competitive. We take you at your word, because in his mind, that's not happening in these cases right now. And so that's one change I think that would be you know very helpful. Um, and then another thing I think his bill does that is good is it says, look, in concentrated markets, we're going to presume, we're going to make a presumption that this is, you know, these are illegal under our antitrust laws. I think putting that into statute would be helpful. And then I think, you know, uh, uh, his bill also sort of goes toward this idea of making sure that, you know, if we are going to keep the consumer welfare standard, it's maxed in full, right? <laughs> we're, we're actually putting it in statute because the consumer welfare standard, Congress never voted on it, right? Congress never wrote it. it, sort of became this sort of judicial theory that we now apply in these cases, but it's actually, I think, taking it and putting it in statutory form gives it its full 
remit. Now, there are other senators that disagree with that, right? You have Josh Hawley on the other side of that, who would have been the consumer welfare standard completely and put in a competition standard. And, you know, I'd like to see these senators make the case for that, because again, it goes back to this idea that, you know, and actually Dan Oliver, who was Ronald Reagan's FTC chair recently wrote an essay about this, that antitrust, again, isn't, it's public policy. And we constantly need to be going back to see if our public policy is doing what we want it to do. And so that's the debate the right needs to have. I'm sort of open to, to all these proposals. Um, I tend toward keeping this, the current system in place, but if it's not actually, if current harms are not cognizable under the standard that we have in place, then we need to ask why, and we need to make those changes. And uh, it might be worth it for our audience. Mike Lee uh, is, of course, the, the oh, top right. Republican <laughs> on uh, the Antitrust Subcommittee in the Senate. Uh, he previously chaired it. So, so what he says, obviously, uh, carries a lot of weight. Uh, Elise, I know we're going to lose you uh, in a minute, so I'm going to give you uh, the last word here. Um, what, uh, <laughs> what is the thing that you think policymakers, uh, judges, lawmakers, enforcers, and even actually companies themselves, what is the worst thing that they could do uh, in the near future, maybe the worst sort of plausible thing that they could do uh, to upend uh, our system of uh, free uh, enterprise and fair competition? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, in the antitrust space in particular, my biggest concern right now is, um, you know, really ignoring the history here, right? So there's, you know, Rachel mentioned the primacy of economics, and I think there's a couple of different things going on in at least the way I heard what you were describing. And some of that is, you know, a lot of this, all of this is speculative, especially like when we're talking about mergers, the, the FTC and the DOJ are constantly trying to predict what they think is going to happen. Um, and so there's, there's that side of it. Um, the, the part that I'm concerned about um, is, you know, when antitrust was trying to do more than figure out the economic harms, when it was trying to achieve socio-political goals, um, it really was, you know, a whole mess. Even Milton Handler, who was, you know, a, a antitrust advisor for FDR, who was, you know, the trust buster, um, he criticized the holdings of antitrust law at the time being, quote, embarrassing holdings and dicta, which no one theory can fully explain short of regarding the cases as fundamentally opposed to one another and vote. So I think, you know, when the Congress and the legislators and policymakers are thinking about what to do here, um, it's really critical that we, you know, keep in mind what what antitrust has proven that it is capable of doing and what it's not capable of doing. Um, and the the struggle with, you know, trying to weigh economic values against socio and political values in the same in the same space, right? If you're a court and you're getting, you know, well, it's going to help these economic values and maybe hurt these socio-political values. You know, how do you how do you as a court weigh them in a way that is, you know, what the public makers want and vindicates what Congress and you know the legislators and the policymakers are trying to achieve? I think it's a lot of really um, complex and really important questions. Uh, well, I want to thank you both uh, so much for being uh, here. Rachel, we're going to hold on to you for the next section, Elise. We, uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Uh, all right. Uh, I want to bring on two more panelists to our discussion. Uh, Dr. David Teese uh, is an economist with more than three decades of experience in industrial organization, competition, and technology, who serves as chairman of the Berkeley Research Group. And Dr. Ling Ling Ang is an expert in financial services, labor, and competition, who serves as an associate director at NARA Economic Consulting and was one of the original economists at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, we're really glad to have them both. Uh, while they're getting situated, I'm going to encourage you all to add your own questions. Uh, again, for our panelists, I'll try to get to them uh, as we go, although I think they'll have a lot to say uh, and uh, put aside uh, a little time uh, to discuss. Um, so welcome to uh, you both. Uh, David and Lingling, Ling, I'm, I'm actually just going to start you uh, off with uh, a phrase that Rachel used earlier on, if you were watching, the primacy uh, of speculative economics. That's one of the big uh, criticisms of current antitrust practice from, from the left and the right. It gives too much power to economists. It makes enforcement expensive. It justifies conduct that lawmakers sought to ban, and it subjects courts to these unresolved sort of speculative uh, debates. Uh, so since the economists actually outnumber us here, uh, I wanted to ask, how do you make, uh, how do you make sure that the econ economists are contributing to really healthy competition? And is there something you would do to uh, improve uh, the practice? And maybe we can start with you, David. And you're on mute. David, I think you're on mute. 
think it should be on the lower left for you. Um, if I'm capable of unmuting you, I will. Uh, Ling Ling, do you want to pick that up while uh, we work on the mute button? <laughs> so, um, you know, of course, as economists, we, we do think we add value. And I think that in terms of the analysis, um, my work has primarily been in litigation, um, although I, I do some merger work as well. And what I would say is that the value that economists add is an intellectual framework as well as applied rigor. Um, I, I'm not going to beat around the bush. What we do gets expensive, but part of that is honestly the vast amount of data work we do. Um, I would say particularly in financial services. If you think about the data we're working with um, and just how you interact with, let's say, your credit card or your bank account, that's multiple transactions a day potentially across years and years and this is data that is large and not evenly spaced so part of what we do is we figure out what the story is and we piece it together empirically um david i'm going to throw it over to you it looks like we have you back on the line yes thank you very much and um it's a very important point here, and I don't think the problem is speculative economics per se. I think the problem is what I call static economics. Um, I've been beating the drum for at least a couple of decades saying that economists need to breathe innovation into their models because the primary driver of competition in any case is innovation. And um, the law and economics framework that we inherited from Chicago and the post-Chicago folks and so forth is inherently what I call equilibrium economics. It's the stuff that economists are familiar with, but it's not the stuff that's useful for understanding the digital economy or the innovation economy. So I think a lot of dumb decisions have been made by the agencies in part because they've been looking with the wrong lens. So uh, it's a very important point because I don't think there's as much wrong with the law as there is with the economics. I think the antitrust laws are actually sufficiently flexible, as was already pointed out. Uh, but I think if we, if we put um, innovation front and center and uh, favor innovation, and favor the future at the same time, we'll, we'll end up with much better policy. And that goes to the consumer welfare standard. I think it's salvageable if we adopt a long run consumer welfare standard. I mean, I know there was a statement earlier that, well, actually under consumer welfare, the agencies look at innovation, but I can tell you, it's my experience, it's always as an afterthought. And if they see a price effect for you know an 18 month period or what have you, that that really gets well exercised. They should be focused instead on innovation and what's going to drive innovation the most. Uh, you know, not whether it's from big tech or from small tech. It's innovation which drives competition. And I think if we had a new um, economic framework. Um, we, we wouldn't necessarily have to monkey around with the law. And uh, uh, I think there's a lot uh, that our profession of economics has to answer for. We stick with static approaches because they're the easiest ones to work with, not because they're the right ones to work with. So um, I think it's kind of a shame that we are where we are and looking to change the law when the real culprit is the economics. Well, we'll uh, have you say that at the next uh, economist meeting. <laughs> uh, so I'm really yeah, no, it's not not popular. It's not popular amongst economists, uh, <laughs> but I can tell you there's a growing beat, a growing drumbeat to recognize that you know when you're dealing with a digital economy, most of the apparatus and the tools and the insights of the past are not particularly useful. And uh, you know there's talk of throwing more money at the agencies. I don't think we need more money at the agencies. We, we, we need different economics. You know, just reallocate the same money to a different uh, intellectual framework and we'd, we'd all be better off. Well, let's talk about some of the newest stuff that's happening. I think one of the particular advantages uh, we have here is that we're coming right after the Biden executive order uh, last week. Um, so much of the conversation in antitrust for the last couple of years has focused on the big four uh, tech companies. Uh, but this order is about telecom. It's about fintech. 
It's about health. Uh, it's about the whole really federal rulemaking apparatus. Uh, so Ling Ling, maybe you can uh, take us through uh, this initially, but I, I want to hear from everybody. Uh, what do you think might be the biggest result of this order uh, that we had last week? And, and do you think it points us uh, in the right direction or not? Um, so I, I think that obviously it's going to focus more attention on financial services. We, we have seen things moving in that direction already, particularly with the DOJ's financial services, FinTech, and banking section coming into effect over the past few months. Um, one of the things that I want to say about what direction this is moving us in is when looking at the executive order, um, something that really caught my eye is the data portability discussion around banking and fintech. So the way that I read, and I'll admit the summary, uh, it's it's been a busy couple of weeks, but um, Ben, thank you for giving us homework. Um, I always want to be a professor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good because it brings us out of the weeds, but, and thank you, that was a really good reading list. Um, so something that struck me about it is the comparison of FinTech to banking, and I suspect that that was oriented towards the consumer. I think the actual role of FinTech is more complex, given the complex way in which financial services are basically produced. So you have FinTech at the consumer level, which you can think of as things like non-bank lending, where the FinTech is front and center to the consumer. But there's also a lot of back-end um, FinTech, which is basically B2B. And so I don't know how much attention that will receive in the future, but it's important to note that that is there too. Also, I think that the dichotomy between banks and FinTech isn't exactly right. Um, in fact, many banks partner with FinTech to expand their capacity. So in terms of financial services, it's obviously a heavily regulated industry. You have both the prudential regulators like the Fed, the OCC, and the FDIC. And you also have the CFPB in certain instances, as well as state regulators. So there's potentially a lot of tech in the background, particularly given the multiple compliance requirements. Um, a small bank may decide to use vendors rather than build out its staff. And I think that that's something that will potentially receive more scrutiny in the future. Um, I'm going to continue talking in consumer welfare world, um, but something that I think is particularly interesting about financial services is that, and I, I think there's a analogs to this in big tech as well, but the products are relationship products in the sense that you open a bank account and a credit card, and it's not just about that first moment of contact with the consumer, but there's this lengthened relationship where you make your monthly payments, and so the, let, let's just use the example of a loan, because I think that that's um, something that most people are familiar with and can digest. So let's say you have a mortgage. You're not only concerned that you made the initial loan, but you're also concerned about the flow of payments, as well as um, what happens if that loan prepays. So it's not only about initial contact, it's about what happens over the duration of the relationship. And one risk is that the relationship ends before one expects it to. Um, that can happen through default, that can happen through prepayment, but there's essentially this valuation of the relationship ex ante. And I think that when we think about um, concepts like data portability, something to keep in mind is what that does to expectations about the relationship both from the consumer perspective as well as from the firm perspective. Uh, Rachel, David, I want to bring you into this. Do you think this executive order, whether the, the components on FinTech or 
telecom and other areas, are, are they pointing us in the right direction? Is it a good uh, first step towards something or, or is it uh, pedaling backwards? Well, this is, this is David. I'll just say a few remarks. One, I, I did like in the executive order the emphasis on innovation as a driver of competition. But when it comes to data and data portability, I, I don't think people have thought through very carefully what the implications of this might be. If, if, if big tech, whether it's European, American, or whatever, has to open up and make data portable, the incentive to collect it is going to go way down. The incentive to compete with proprietary data sets is going to go way down. And data security problems are going to go way up. Uh, so I don't think anyone's really thought very hard about this. This is not quite the arm act and unbundling. It's something that's way more complicated and guaranteed to lead to enormous disputes over the value of the data, who should pay who, how much. And uh, and uh, I think uh, to quote Sam Palmisano, the former executive at IBM, uh, the person who's probably pleased with all of this is uh, Xi Jinping because it's likely that uh, we give away the lead in the eye if we start fragmenting big data and dampening the incentive to collect it. Uh, as a nation, uh, we're likely to lag in AI, and there are consequences of that that go way beyond uh, uh, competition policy. Rachel, is this the right direction? So I do think that, you know, more critical analysis of, of concentration in the economy writ large is a good thing. What I'm concerned about the way that I see this executive order is that it's not, you know, going to do that in the way that I think is appropriate, which again is bringing antitrust enforcement cases. It's actually just window dressing for more of a regulatory effort on a lot of these fronts. And I see the two as very distinct, right? There's an effort, I think, among some on the right to conflate regulation and antitrust, but I think they're quite distinct. I think antitrust is a much better tool. You know, I, I don't want to throw too much shade on the economists because I do think economics is actually a really big, important part of antitrust because it does give that very um, sort of very specific uh, analysis that I think is very important when you do bring these cases. It's why I think antitrust is almost a better tool to address concentration because it can be very specific. It's designed to be that way. Regulation, on the other hand, I think, you know, is sort of one size fits all broad bite at some of these problems. And so if it goes in that direction, I don't think it will be nearly as helpful as if it was instead focused on sort of bringing these enforcement cases through the lens of antitrust. And I think that remains to be seen. Great. Uh, I'm going to grab uh, actually a question uh, from the audience. This is from Susan Aronson. Um, she asked, how can antitrust address the opaque business practices firms use to collect and then monetize troves of personal data, um, e.g. taking uh, data not central to their functions, et cetera? Is that an antitrust problem? Is privacy and data collection, are they antitrust problems? Um, is, personal, is it a personal data protection problem or an inadequate governance problem? And that's a jump ball for whoever wants to take it. Um, I'll, maybe I'll give my two cents and then let the real experts weigh in here. But I sort of mentioned this in, in the beginning. I do think that this notion of data and is can be particular to antitrust. And I think perhaps with these big tech companies, it should be. I don't think it currently is. But what we're talking about is, you know, with these zero price markets, the parcel of exchange is your data. It is what's driving the transaction. You give your data, which is then monetized into ad revenue in exchange for the ability to post, post your content and view, view the content of your friends. You know, in our contract law, right? We say anything of value that's traded is, is the basis, you know, for enforcement. Why is that not the case here, you know, in our antitrust law? So I do think that that's going to require more novel legal theories and people to bring cases under that. I don't think anyone has, but I do think antitrust can work around these data markets, um, you know, and perhaps, you know, get at some of, you know, how, how these big tech companies operate and, and bring sort of, you know, if there's anti-competitive actions around that, they can, they can address that. Now, data privacy writ large, I think that that's a question of policy, right? I don't think antitrust can actually address what I think has to be a policy question for our lawmakers, and that's that's a separate one, so. David, Ling Ling. Um, so, so I'm going to lean into what I've just been doing for the past decade and go back to financial services, which I think is an interesting area because there's interest in actually more data versus less data in that area, particularly for underwriting. So there have been discussions about using alternative data, which differs from standard credit scores and standard information the banks have. 
And it really opens up a bunch of questions. The first is, let's say that consumers have full data portability. What does it mean or what signal does it send when you don't want to share your data? You kind of want to leave your last bank account behind you um, or your history with your last bank account behind you. I think that that introduces a lot of interesting effects that will involve careful analysis. But but that's kind of a question that um, I want to raise. Also, I think that it'd be helpful to think about what the counterfactual is. Like, does this additional data element necessarily change prices or attributes for a consumer, or is it just more data? And what's the trade-off? Um, I, I know that there's been a history of, well, what happens if your data is wrong? Um, and does it positively affect you or negatively affect you? Um, I just think there are so many questions that are basically about the effect of data in corporate decision making. And um, I know we go back to this and the role of economists, but, but I think that it's valuable to think through these questions and to also hopefully dig into the parents as well. David, do you want to take a swing at that? No, only to say I think it's a deep quagmire. It's a deep quagmire, and I'm not willing to step into it right now. But anyone that thinks this is simple and straightforward is wrong. <laughs> Uh, that is fair enough. Uh, I want to turn uh, all of your attention to the uh, recent package of six antitrust bills uh, that the House Judiciary Committee advanced uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, to remind everyone, let's see if I have this list right. Uh, it has uh, a bill on venues for state enforcers, one on update for merger filing fees, one on data portability and interoperability, one on non-discrimination requirements by big platforms, one uh, that clamps down on mergers and all but bans them really by the biggest platforms, and perhaps the most controversial one that allows the government to seek uh, split ups uh, when there is uh, a conflict of interest by these major platforms. Uh, there were a lot of questions about how wide these should go. Should they focus on the big four or go bigger? Were were they already focusing on more companies? Uh, so maybe, uh, David, we'll, we'll kind of start with you. Uh, do we need competition rules for big tech only, or should they go broader? And uh, if these were to pass, what do you think some of the provisions would be that would affect other sectors, uh, and maybe who, and how, uh, maybe who would be fighting it as a result? Well, I don't think we need special rules for big tech, but we do need to rethink the nature of competition. The, the, the standard sort of industrial age view of competition and uh, markets being defined by industries uh, is kind of all wrong, uh, in my view. Um, it, you know, it's usually ecosystem to ecosystem competition, and it's what I call broad spectrum. So Google is competing, you know, with Amazon and Apple, and uh, the companies, the big companies are not really staying to their swim lanes. So folks that sort of, tab, you know, tabulate traditional concentration ratios, in my view, are not doing a meaningful exercise of what's going on. And in general, they underestimate the amount of competition there is. And the amount of, quote, monopoly there supposedly is. Um, I think many of these companies are profitable only because they stay good and they stay efficient. A company like Amazon is profitable, not because it's engaging in monopoly pricing, but because it has an incredibly efficient operating model that's very much driven on AI. And it's able to run its uh, delivery mechanism and its whole production system, if you will, so much more efficiently than um, than the companies it's competing with. So I think we have to really look hard at the way that we uh, calibrate competition. I think when we do so, we'll find there's a lot more competition than most people think. That's not to say there aren't issues. There clearly are. And, and I think uh, that mergers uh, have been... Um, mishandled uh, in part because we don't have a good theory of potential competition. And that may be what you're referring to earlier with the speculative nature of economics. And in my view, um, you know, you need to kind of understand capabilities of firms to understand their likely future trajectories. So a lot of the 
speculative mistakes that we've made are because we've got the wrong theories about firms and enterprises. And that comes back to my basic point at the beginning. We need innovation economics to inform a marketplace where digital competition and innovation are front and center. And until we do that, we're, we're, we're going to keep making mistake after mistake. Ling Ling, Rachel, do we need competition for big tech? Uh, and is are other people going to get swept in here? I think there's. Oh, please go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> Sorry. So um, thanks. So I I do. It, it's sort of interesting to look at the House and Senate approach at the same time because the House, I think in a well-meaning effort was trying to deal with just big tech, but in a way that I think would ripple, well, perhaps unintentionally or intentionally into the rest of the economy. And that's why I think you're seeing some of the Senate approaches put out reforms for the the entire economy. But I, what was striking to me about those the House bills is that I think that they almost tried to split the baby too much because I think Congress has a choice. They can either go in and very aggressively dictate how they want these companies to act, how they want them to perform and be in the market and be very clear about it, which these bills were not, or they can in, you know, update the antitrust laws such that those laws will do it for them, which they sort of tried to get at but didn't. And so I think they have to choose one or the other for this to be an effective approach. I do think personally, you know, I don't think you can go after one sector effectively without it rippling into the entire economy. So you might as well just, you know, look at the whole state, you know, of our antitrust laws versus the economy and reform it there, which I think is what the Senate is trying to do. But, you know, I think people forget to, you know, when you were looking at these House bills, our legislative process is iterative. We haven't seen it in so long <laughs> that we forget that, like, this is an iterative process. What they put out is not going to be the final product, but I do think it was the first time in decades that you've seen Congress actually grapple with a public policy problem and try to solve it in a way that reflects almost back to the 1970s when Wright Patman worked with the Nixon administration to break up the holding companies, right? That was the last real analog, public policy analog we have for this. So they didn't get it perfectly right, I don't think, in this effort, um, but I do think, you know, it was interesting to me that you this wasn't party line. You you had a lot of cross partisan effort to try and get this done, which tells me that again, this is an iterative process. This is step one. I, I tend to think you're going to get to a whole of economy approach before you get to a single sector approach, but this is going to be an ongoing battle battle for them over the next several years. So I think that something that was interesting in the set of six items is the increased focus on states. What we're seeing more and more of, and this is by no means a representative sample of essentially things I click on um, when I'm looking at recent case filings, is cases that are filed exclusively under state antitrust laws, which is something that I don't think I have personally seen until probably the past year or so. And I, I think that that is potentially um, something that we'll see more in the future. Um, one of the cases that comes to mind is the Camp Rouse Coffee versus Visa, which basically um, is a cartel case that alleges that Visa and MasterCard are um, using their market share to keep credit and debit card fees high that has similarities to US versus Visa from about 20 years ago. And something that strikes me about the contrast of the two cases is just the time that has passed. And the fact that industries outside of big tech are evolving and there is the potential for entry due to changes in the underlying technology, like if you were to look at a payment terminal in the 90s, it would literally be wired um, to the network. But now there's the potential to do things completely wirelessly. And so that potentially changes the landscape. And I think that um, financial services is not the only place that we're seeing that evolution. And like David said, we have to think about innovation and innovation 
I think that the key here is to really think about the applied problems we see and for the folks who do both policy and economics, not that they're not intertwined, um, to look towards what is actually happening in tech and how that might change how we think about particular applied um, antitrust problems. Great. Uh, I'm actually going to take uh, another question from the audience, but it's something that we uh, all discussed a little bit before. Um, what is the greater risk, over or under enforcement? Um, we obviously want a dynamic and innovative economy. Uh, what is the greater risk, and, and which way do you think uh, enforcers have been leaning more uh, in recent years? Well, I'll have a go, go at it, if I may. I think the greater risk is that we're going to go too far too quickly. It's like we did nothing for a long time, then all of a sudden we're trying to do everything. And you know, if I'm right that the underlying intellectual framework is inadequate in economics and, and is not up to the task, we really need some serious research that's you know uh, around dynamic competition and really understanding it and operationalizing it. So. You know, I would sooner see some small steps here, uh, but vigilance uh, and a serious effort to really come to understand the nature of digital transformation in the economy and the, the new forms of competition, uh, that are ecosystem based that are emerging. Now, us economists have all jumped on to, well, it's all about platforms, isn't it? And so 95% of the profession is jumping in and and redefining the antitrust problem as a platform issue, and platforms is just one piece of it. And uh, I see that in Europe, where um, you know, the, in the UK, they're talking about let's set up a digital platforms division or whatever of their antitrust agency or competition agency. No, let's let's infuse an understanding of innovation through the entire agencies, you know, whether it's the Fair Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice. You know, setting something up in the corner. Uh, and not letting it sort of impact the entirety of what we do is, is not the right approach. Although it may be, it, is, it could be a temporary first step. But I, but I do think uh, there's a real serious danger, of policy error, when we don't really know what we're doing. I mean, I think right now we're living in the consequences of under enforcement. Um, I think that that has been the the zeitgeist for the last you know 30 years or so, and I think that it, you know unprecedented levels of concentration, particularly in the tech sector, are the result. So under enforcement, I think, is a risk. But I think to the point David just made, the pendulum is swinging wildly right now. And no one knows where it's going to stop yet. Um, and I think, you know, obviously, if you it's you know, you listen to partisans sort of on both sides of this debate, if it stops in under enforcement, the world's going to end. If it stops in over enforcement, the world's going to end. So naturally, you know, I think it's probably hopefully going to stop somewhere right in the middle, because where I sit, we have antitrust laws for a reason and they work and, you know, they, they are there to, designed to protect the marketplace. So I think getting that enforcement right is paramount. Now, whether or not that comes with a, a number of sort of statutory policy changes to sort of govern, you know, the outer the outer bounds of, of what that looks like, you know, that's where I think, you know, we, we could tend to see a little bit more sort of top-down control than a lot of us are comfortable with. But I do think that robust antitrust enforcement is it's a due process process, right? You know, it is a, a matter of law. And so I think if we are, the right step here is to enforce the laws as they exist. Turning our back and ignoring that, I, I think is will be detrimental to, to the free market as we've known it. I would agree with that 100%. I do think we have to enforce the laws as they exist. And there's less wrong with the laws than there is with our understanding of competition, in my view. So that's why the focus should be less on legislative change, more on doubling down, tripling down on understanding the nature of competition. And that may involve some experimentation with cases that we can learn from, uh, but sort of a wholesale change in the law, I think would be a big mistake. Ling Ling, did you want to add anything? Yeah, so I, I, I do think that um, it's possible for us to operate dirt under the current framework. I, I think another thing that will be interesting over the next few months, if not years, is seeing where the focus is on industries beyond big tech. Um, I think that 
the choice of cases can be driven um, by basically what's hot and what's top of mind. So I hope that there is also an intellectual um, motivation behind what cases are of interest in addition to a focus on what's top of mind and, and what's in the news. Uh, there you go. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, uh, so I'm going to put the same question uh, to you three that I put to Elise before she left. Um, what would be the worst thing, uh, the worst reasonably plausible thing, uh, that lawmakers, uh, enforcers, courts, and businesses uh, could do uh, to antitrust policy in the coming years uh, and really overturn uh, our fair competition system? So I actually agree with what Elise said um, at the at the at the end. You know, I think when she's her point about using antitrust to enforce socioeconomic goals um, and and sort of anything in that vein, I think that that's that would be a, a very bad outcome here, right? Antitrust again is competition law. <laughs> I think anytime you try to infuse more than that into it, you're going down sort of a, a path where you are subverting the point of, of what the laws exist to do. Um, so, and in many ways, I think a lot of people think, characterize that sort of the Brandeisian era as that, where you had judges sort of pushing their own progressive policy goals into enforcement. Now there's obviously debate about whether or not that's a correct characterization, but I think a lot of conservatives view it that way. And so I think any attempt to do that um, would be a very negative outcome in, in my view. Now, I think we can still update the law and make sure that its actual enforcement goals are being met without doing that. So I don't see this as a binary, um, but I do think, by, but I agree with her that that would be a very bad outcome. Yes, and, and um, I, I think that there's really two things going on at once and we need to separate them out. And that is that there has been a challenge to the constitutional rights of everybody, of Americans uh, by big tech. Um, and to confuse that as a competition issue rather than a free speech issue is, is I think a major problem. So we need to move that clutter, very important, uh, to one side and, and deal with it and, and not confuse it as a competition policy. It's not the consequence of quote, big tech monopoly. It's, it's, it's a consequence of, um, you know, in my view, uh, you know, excessive controls uh, by big tech on free speech. Um, that is not fully balanced and representative of, of the American people and, and of, of their constitutional rights. So dealing with those issues so that they don't cloud competition policy issues is, is very important. And I think they need to be the priority and give us a little bit more time to figure out the competition, the true competition policy questions. But recognize that those competition policy questions do interact with technology policy and industrial policy. And we can no longer you know, compete globally in a world where other countries are using competition policy uh, in an integrated way with their technology policy and their industrial policy. Uh, we're, we're incredibly naive if, if, if we don't look at the international dimensions of what's involved here. Uh, but so far, I see almost no attention to it by anybody. And I think that's also a, a huge policy mistake or, or potentially that lays the foundation for a policy mistake and potentially a national security mistake. So I agree with David about taking a broader international view. Um, I mean, we're dealing with multinationals here and I think that understanding how U.S. policy fits into a broader global framework um, is extremely important. I also think that given the complexity of various sectors, um, I hope that we don't lose sight of how deep the institutional detail is, as well as how um, important it is to not only be empirical, but update the empirical analysis with the times, both in terms of innovation, as well as in terms of breathing in new economics into the analysis, or new economic techniques into the analysis. 
Great. Well, uh, I think uh, that is our hour, or that's our 50, uh, hour exactly uh, on the clock. So I want to thank uh, Rachel Bovard, Dr. Ling Ling Yang, Dr. David Teese uh, for being uh, a part of this panel. And uh, thank you uh, all for viewing. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, guys.